does a government steal a child and then imprison him? How does it keep it a secret? This story is how. Assalamu alaikum, hello, and welcome to the 13th edition of the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature at Al Surkal Avenue. My name is Sally Musa, and today, on the final day of the festival, we welcome back one of the most extraordinary poets of our time. A man who knows more than most what it takes to change the story. Lemsisse is a multi-award winning writer, international poet, performer, playwright, artist, and broadcaster. He has won and been nominated for BAFTA awards, received an MBE for services to literature, as well as winning the Penn Pinter Prize in 2019. He has read on stage throughout the world, including the Library of Congress in the United States to the University of Addis Ababa, from Singapore to Sri Lanka, from Bangalore to Bali, from Greenland to Wigan Library. And of course, we have been lucky enough to witness his magic right here in Dubai. He is the Chancellor of the University of Manchester and he's an honorary doctor from the Universities of Huddersfield, Manchester, Kent and Brunel. He was the official poet of the London 2012 Olympics and he has been a judge for many a literary award, not least of which was the 2020 Booker Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lem Sisse. Thank you so much. What a blessing. <laughs> I'm sorry if you can hear the noise in the background, uh, but uh, it's, real, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, welcome, welcome to my front room. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my front room. It's not my front room, but it's my room in my London apartment. And I'm really pleased you're here. As you can see behind me, just here, this is where I keep my awards. You see, I'm right front and center there. And also behind me here, you can see, a, this is James Baldwin, an yes. incredible writer. Yes. And here, this is, um, an artist called Afawerk Tekli, who is the most, uh, was the most, is the most famous, he's passed now, but the most famous artist in Ethiopia. Um, and you can see some symbols of Ethiopia above that as well. Anyway, welcome to my place. It's a real, it's a real <laughs> pleasure to be here. I would say that, I would say, you know, I, I, I would say that I wish I was there in person but actually I am here in person and you are there in person. And, and you know, as the world is consumed by this pandemic and the restrictions that it puts on us, we have found a way to be in contact and in touch with each other. So yeah. this is as real as it gets, making this effort for you to be there on this day in the theater and for me to be here is, 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 Incredible, actually. It's quite incredible. It so is. Thanks for being here. It is. It is phenomenal to have you. You were meant to be sitting opposite me here on the stage, but we are so glad that you... We are in your front room. How amazingly yeah, gorgeous. In front room. Love the colours. Love it. And, you know, it speaks to who you are, which is what this conversation is, of course, all about. You know, we are going to be discussing, Lem, your latest book, My Name Is Why?, which is this one for those who haven't seen the cover yet. Um, you know, you have told, there it is, thank you, perfect. <laughs> you have told parts of your story before of how you were in fact stolen from your mother of growing up in the Northern England care system. And it's really interesting reading the book though, because in My Name Is Why, you actually tell the story in harrowing, but somehow at the same time, lyrical detail in only the way that you can. 
It's pretty incredible. And the whole thing, the whole book is written around the documents from the, the caseworkers who worked on your case and within the system. It's all from your file. And this is the only record that you actually had of your life, of anything to do with your life up until the age of 18. So talk to us about what that was like, reviewing these documents and writing the book around them. Well, if we can, um, if we can talk a little bit about what family is, because essentially family is a set of storytellers telling stories about each other to each other. So that could be your grandmother saying, I remember when you was born, I remember how much you weighed, I remember the first time I looked into your eyes, I remember the first time you walked, I remember the first time uh, you said a word, yeah. <laughs> you know? And then you grow into your early teens and you may, your parents or your brother or sister may remember your personality and may be able to tell you about your personality. And they will, somebody in the family may say, you were like this. And you can say, no, I wasn't, I'm like this. And you can have a little argument and a little you know, resolve and you can fall out you know, in your teenage years maybe, or rebelling a little bit. Um, you're finding out about who you are in relation to, relative to the people around you. I didn't have that. I didn't have anybody who would tell me what I was, uh, who would remember a date, who would uh, tell me the first time I said a word, who would tell me the first time I went to school. You know, the minute memory um, moments that become so frequent that we forget that they're even there. We say, I want to go to university, I want to grow up, I want to fly away, you know, from my family, I'll come to visit them, but I want to be my own person. And we, 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 we forget how dependent we are on a place that holds our memory in mind, even if we disagree with it. I didn't have that. You know, when I left the children's homes at 18, I didn't know anybody who had known me for longer than a year or two. Because all the different children's homes had different children in them. They would leave after a couple of months or a year. The staff would change every uh, four hours uh, and then the staff would leave. You know, so there was nobody who knew who I was, most of all me. From the very beginning, you were born from a, a woman who came from Ethiopia. She came to the UK, not realizing that she was pregnant. I will let you tell the story. But I, well, I, I, want, to, I want to ask you first, before you do, because you were fostered into a family and they were meant to be your own. And in fact, on the cover of the book is you at five years, I think five or six years of age in that photo on the cover. Yeah. And you're just like, you're standing proud and you're confident and you've got your foster brother and sister next to you. You know, just this amazing young child. I wanna ask you, you know, as you speak to those, those memories, you know, what is your first memory of love, Lem? And when did you realize that something wasn't right? Just to finish what I was saying just before, and then I will come to the question because I think it's relevant. I spent my life searching for my files because in my childhood, every month, every few weeks, a file was opened and uh, a report was written about me. Mm. So the only memories that I can speak to, speak with, from my childhood are 18 years of files which were written about me from many different people, social workers, etc., etc. And when I got those files, that's when I wanted to write the memoir because I had a 
I had a, a, a record, a set of records. It's very unusual that one child through for 18 years yeah. will have reports written about them every three, 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 three uh, weeks. So that was that. Um, my first memory of love, I don't, I don't, uh, this is going to sound quite, you know, uh, but it's true. I, I, when I was, okay, sorry. Are you okay, audience? We're perfectly you, good. Are they okay? I want you to be okay. They're hanging on your every word. Okay, Go. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I realize sometimes when I tell my story that it's important to acknowledge that we all have our stories and each story is unique. But my mother came to England to study in the 1960s under the, um, under the it was like a system of expansion uh, um, where, where the emperor Haile Selassie uh, wanted the, a certain set of people who were in education to go across to the world to learn skills and bring them back to Ethiopia. It was a great time, the, the, the late 1960s. For some people, it was a great time in Ethiopia. Um, my mother came to England, found that she was pregnant uh, at the college in Berkshire, and then she was sent to the north of England to be held in a mother and baby home. Mm. Now, these mother and baby homes were situated all throughout England, and they were for women who were pregnant but who were not married. Um, um, remember, my mother had been in the country for maybe six months, um, and she was sent to this dark institution in the north of England. She will have been the only person of colour, the only uh, African, Ethiopian woman um, in the place. She spoke three languages. She was highly educated. She was 21 years of age just on the bridge between adulthood and childhood. I am so sorry, I didn't turn my own phone off. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to call you back. I am in the middle of some magic. I'm so sorry. So my mother was Go sent ahead. to this mother and baby home and um, she, she um, and the primary purpose of that mother and baby home was to take the child from the mother and have it adopted. And a, a adoption in England meant that you would never see the child again, ever. Mm. So many of these very vulnerable women in these homes would sign the adoption paper thinking that they could see their child again, but they never did. I should say to you that in England at the moment, there is a lot of consternation uh, and a lot of anger from the mothers who are in those homes, who are now in their 70s mm. and who are now speaking their stories. It's a very current issue here in England and in Ireland. Um, but my mother would not sign the adoption papers. You know, she said, I don't, I don't I'm not giving him away. I want him back, but I, I need somebody to look after him because I'm in the country, I'm on my own and I need him to be fostered and then I'll take him back to Ethiopia. My mother then, so then the social worker took me from her, which, you know, fostering is, is not unusual. Moses was fostered and adopted, you know. It's, 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 there's many people who are, um, and I know Moses is in the Quran as well as in many other religions. So, so, uh, but the, the social worker gave me to the foster parents and said, treat this as an adoption, he's yours forever, okay? His name is Norman. And he gave me to the foster parents and I never, I didn't see my mother again ever in my childhood, in 18 years. I was told by my foster parents that she didn't want me, that she didn't care, etc., cetera, et cetera. And I would put it to you and to any person here that when a, if a woman gives away her child forever, okay, for adoption, my mother did not do that. But if a woman does, I believe that we should see her as a heroine 
Because if a person gives away their child to a better life, they are sacrificing this, this being that will just give them love. You know, most women who've had a child can feel this explosion of love that happens in them. It's very complicated sometimes, but actually they feel it. So for a mother to give a child away because she believes that child will have a better life, that should be seen as an incredible act of heroism. But it's not, is it? In England, you know, women who people would often say to an adopted child, oh, your mother didn't want you. Yeah. You know, she didn't care. So for nine months, this woman was carrying a baby inside of her and she didn't want it. You see? The shame, so, the shame so, that, yeah, that yeah. The, the whole thing is. But the shame is often not her shame. She is doing the most natural thing in, in uh, most natural thing that a, a woman can do in some ways. I'm not saying that, you know, you're a woman right. if you have a baby. That's not true. You're a woman, you're a woman. But actually the act of having a baby is what makes the world go round, quite literally. Mm. Um, and, and the idea that she should be filled with shame is, feels cruel to me. Um, anyway, my mother didn't want that. Um, and she w went back to Ethiopia. I'll just tell you her story. She married the vice minister to finance under the emperor, Haile Selassie. She was from a very high family in Ethiopia, um, very international family. My father was a pilot for Ethiopian Airlines um, in the uh, late 60s, which were the emirates of their day. Mm. I must tell you, in fact, I know a few pilots who are from Ethiopia who fly emirates. Who are, who are pilots for Emirates. I, a couple of times when I've been to Dubai, I've been to meet them. The airline, um, uh, they know my father, um, uh, or they knew my father, he passed away. But, but yeah, so, but I didn't know any of this. In England, I was with my foster parents and I loved them and they loved me and I had what I thought was normal and they taught me to call them mummy and daddy and, you know, they, they said, you're, you're ours, you're the chosen one, we chose you, mm. you know, and you were ours forever. And I had a, a, you know, an aunt and uncles and cousins and grandparents and I would visit on a Sunday and uh, I had a magical childhood like many of us have a magical type childhood. They were a lower middle class family who just worked up from the working class to this middle class. My father was a teacher, my mother was a nurse. And um, when I was 12 years of age, they had had one brother, that was my brother Christopher, and two sisters, two daughters, and that was Helen and, and uh, Sarah. And at 12 years of age, I started to you know, take biscuits from the tin without asking. I, I, I started to stay out a little later with my friends on the park. And I started to, they were very, very religious. They were Baptist Christians. And um, they, they, you know, they spoke about when I would break the rules by staying out late they spoke about how the devil works and how, how, and I used to tell lies, you know, they'd say, what are you doing? Where were you? And I'd say, oh, I was just out with my friends when I was somewhere else, you know, whatever. And they sort of, they sort of, you know, lying was evil, the work of the devil. And they sort of, they tried to convince me that there was a battle inside of me between good and bad, between the devil and God, and that bad was winning. And that at 12 years of age, they put me into children's homes and said they'd never visit me again. And I lost everything. 
I lost my mum, my dad, my sisters and brothers, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my grandparents, grandma, my first girlfriend, my town, my school, my village, everything that I had ever known. You didn't even they take anything me. with you. You actually didn't, you didn't even take anything with didn't, you. They didn't give me anything. They wouldn't give me my toys or nothing, clothing or anything. I, 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 it was like being in an emotional Hiroshima. Like everything that I'd ever known, I, I had been destroyed and burnt and blown away. And then I was placed into a very large children's home, um, like a big Victorian building with turrets in the top of it, a bit like Harry Potter, but, but not as nice. There is, um, there is this moment, though, just as you say, you know, they were really trying to kind of instill that in you, that there was something inherently wrong with you. It's interesting because when you were younger, it seemed like you could never win because ultimately you were going to become a young black man. If you excelled, you were getting unnecessary attention because of your color. People felt sorry for you. They treated you better. But then if you were bad, well, see... There you go. We told yeah, you. Yeah, I couldn't win. I couldn't win. And I think that when you see the files in, the, in my book, you see that they, they were very just confused people. Mm. You see, it's very easy. They say they, their, their narrative was that they'd saved a poor black baby from Africa. Okay. Now, this is something that they, you know, there, this assumes that there are no adults in Africa as well, you know. It's the white saviour complex. It's the white saviour complex. Mm. And it's a very real one here in England. Um, it's a very, very real one. And, um, and they couldn't believe any other narrative. And so when I started to become a person, and basically, ladies and gentlemen, everybody liked me when I was a baby, you know, when I was a child, from 0 to 12, you know, I just had the kind of personality which wanted to light up every room that I walked in, you know. And I, I, that's, I can say that because I'm very different as an adult and I've been through a lot of stuff between then and now, but it's just who I was. It wasn't like I was trying to hurt anybody or be, I wasn't trying to put my sh a shadow over anybody, but, but they assumed that my personality was, was devious yeah. and was deliberately trying to, for example, and this is in the book, the head teacher of my junior school suggests that they give me away because she, he actually says this, Lem's successes, sorry, Norman's successes are too many for Christopher to cope with. Your foster brother, yeah. Yeah, you see, their birth child was a natural introvert. I loved him and he loved me. Well, I think he did. We, we were just brothers. I was, you know, chalk and he was cheese. We were very different. He was an introvert, I was an extrovert, but they believed that my being who I was, was a direct attack on their other children. And this is, this is just cruelty. Now, may I just say one thing? Just, I just want to share this with you. Of course. This happens in all families. You know, one child is one way, another child is... And you know what? Sometimes the parents get it wrong. They think, oh, that child is... We have to give this child more attention because that child doesn't need it. Actually, I needed just love, just, you know, and, and Chris just needed love. Mm -hmm. So these are the normal challenges of a family. Mm -hmm. How do we keep Lem to be quiet? <laughs> Every room he's in, Norman wants to talk and make people smile, which is what I wanted to do. Um, but if you imagine that one of those children is thrown away for that reason. So you may grow up and you think, oh, my mother and father, they always thought I was the quiet one. They always thought I was the intelligent one. They always thought I was the funny one, whatever it is. 
But imagine at 12 years of age, if your mother and father looked you in the eye and said, because of the way you are, you're never going to see any of us ever again. And most of all, that's important for you to understand is it's your fault. So the point is, is that what happened to me can happen to any of us. This is why what happened to me gives a great insight. You know, parents will tell their child who they are. The child may argue with that or may agree with it. The point is, we'll right back to the beginning again that we were speaking about, memory. Memory is love. That's why your grandma will constantly tell you about who you are and who you were. And that's why you do it with your own children. It's love. Yeah. That's what birthdays are and Christmas and Easter's and weekends. That's why when you move away from your family, you miss them. You cry because you're like, I just need to be at home. And they know that. And they want you to be independent, but they know that, that you'll always be connected. That's memory and that's love. Now, my family said, you do not deserve the memory of us and we will wipe you from our memory. It really is. Your book is a book about love and its conditions yeah. and the way, the way it manifests itself in, in so many different ways. But one of the most beautiful um, and striking lessons from it is, is this line. If we do not receive the love that we need and crave, it doesn't mean that it's not our fault. I just, that was something that really hit me. But then when you went into care, things just got worse and worse. Well, you know, I was looking at my files the other day, and then in fact I was reading my, my book. I grew up in a God-fearing household. You know, the foster parents were very religious. And, you know, whatever the religion, I think it's a good thing to offer your child what it is that you believe. Because, the, because if you believe it, you give it to your child, whatever it is that you believe, by the way. But they showed me that, and so I was a very good child, you know, like I was very polite, um, etc. cetera. Um, within a year... It actually says in the book, I, I was, sometimes I read it, I read the files again. I was glue sniffing in the children's zone, sniffing glue that was in a bag, you know, to my, within a year of being in the children's home. You know, the effect of having so many traumatized teenagers around me, just the, the, it, that, that was it. You know, the, the, and it's very important to say they were traumatized. Glue sniffing is, is horrible. It is self-harm. You know, 13 years old. You know, at 14 years of age, I slit my own wrists. Sorry to say this, folks. I, uh, it's a bit, you know, but, it, but it's true. And it's actually, and it's in my files. So I was placed into, a, into a, a home of traumatic teenagers in a care system which did not know how to look after us. It was just the complete opposite of everything that you needed and something else that struck me about that, which I never realized because when we think of violence towards somebody, we think of physical violence or yes, things like that. But actually not being touched yes not having anyone to hug you to hold you to see yeah. you to hold space for you none of that is an incredibly violent act yes it is a violent act thank you thank you it is a violent act and i've got to say you know this pandemic especially here in england people are, are starting to speak about not being touched and how important touch is. From 12 years of age, I was never touched by an adult. I was never hugged. And they called it care. You know, they said, we're going to care for you in the system. And 
you know, and, and that is emotional violence. And what was worse about it is that it was never acknowledged that not being touched would have a detrimental effect on my emotional well-being as a child. For the rest of my childhood, I was never touched. It's unbelievable. It is really, I mean, you know, like you, you need to tell us, that, you know, what, what does that do to a child? You, you were talking about, you know, self-harm, the destructive way that it made you feel, but it, it makes you feel invisible, doesn't it? You were disappearing. <laughs> That's right. The more, that's right. Uh, that's right. As I mean, the more as I grew in the children's homes, uh, they used to move me just occasionally. Um, every year or so, they would move me to a different children's home. And um, I have to get to, used to a different set of people who would forget me or who would not be in touch with me when I left. So each children's home I was in, I felt more invisible as a human being. But remember, I was incredibly visible. I was the only black boy in the town. I grew up in the villages of Lancashire. Mm. So I was hyper English, you know? I didn't know any people of color, people who looked like me, you know? Um, so if you can imagine what that was like, all I heard were the negative things that people say about people in color, of color. Mm. And then they would say, but you're not, you know, you're not like them. You're not one of those, mm. you know? You, and, saw, you and, saw Lenny Henry on stage yeah, 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 for the yeah. first time. You saw a person of color. Talk to us about that experience, what that did for you. It must be like, um, yeah, I, 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 in the children's homes, we used to go to see the pantomime, which is a kind of theatre here in England, which is very joyous. Mm. It's for children and adults, and it's a, it's a tradition here in England. Um, it's not actually in anywhere else in the world, I, I don't think, um, pantomime. But all of the children from the children's homes were taken to a pantomime at a very big theatre um, by the seaside. And um, performing on that evening was a writer, actually, and a comedian uh, and an actor, a very famous man here in England called Lenny Henry. And um, he was asking, right, does anybody else want to come onto the stage? Who wants to come and have a chat with me? And all the audience were like, ah, me, 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 me. <laughs> You know, he'd look over there and they'd go, me, me, me. And then when he looked in my direction, all of the children from the children's home said, Norman, Norman, Norman. Isn't that beautiful? And he said, right, you. And, um, <coughs> and I went up on stage. And that's the first time I'd been close to a black man. And uh, that's the first time I'd been on stage. And... And I remembered it when I was writing the book. Uh, but I, because I didn't have a memory, I, because my memory is terrible, because, because of what happened to me, as I explained earlier, I had to look on Wikipedia when I was writing the book to see if he really was in that place at that time. And there it is. Lenny Henry, the only black comedian on television at that time. Uh, at Blackpool. Unbelievable. And, and, and there, there it is, you know, again, that idea that you need those memories. Your book is actually, it's punctuated with, with your poetry. I love this so much. I'm not defined by darkness, confided the night. Each dawn I am reminded I am defined by light. Yeah, I mean, those were the kinds of things that I was saying to myself in the children's homes. Not that line, but like the thought that I'm not bad. I haven't done anything wrong. This is not fair, you know, and there was nobody to listen to. So I had to hold on like uh, to a um, to base camp, to a flag in the mountainside amidst the raging storm and just at some part of myself had to believe that there is light, that this will pass, that it's not my fault 
Um, there's one line in there, I am the bull in a china shop, and with all my strength and will, as the storm smashed the steep teacups, I stood still. So there I was, you know, with all of this damage and trauma around me and inside me, and the only little light I had to hold on to them to was myself saying, you're a good person, you're a good person, you're not a bad person, you don't deserve this. Everything around you is telling you that this is your fault, but you haven't done anything. And, 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 and just hold on. And even when I had a breakdown in the children's homes, um, I could still hold on to the fact that I, I wasn't wrong. And that's how poetry found you, essentially. Yeah, it did, yeah. And it, I mean, in, in, in the children's homes, I, 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 wrote, I wrote poems and they sort of anchored me somehow. They gave me a sense of memory. They, 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 they recorded things. And of you know when you go on well. holiday with your friends yes. when you're a child? yes. When you're a child, if you go on holiday with your friends, how much do you love talking about it with them? When you were a kid, you know, when you were just a child, you'd be like, oh, we did this. Do you remember when we, do you remember when we did that? <laughs> and, and just the act of speaking yeah. about what it was, you maybe you should try after this event, try remembering something that was really good and then call the person and just say, I just want to chat about when we went out yeah. And we had that time. Do you remember that time, how good it was? And you can, I can even feel it now in myself. You know, when you're talking about that memory, it's just, it, 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 it um, awakens the feelings that you had at that time. Yeah. And you're enlivened by it. This is why families have birthdays and Christmases and weddings and funerals. All of these events are to to find memory and connection. And I, 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 can, I, I can only tell you that you know how important it is when it's gone. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't want to be, you know, but when a person passes, all you're left with is the memory. Mm. And you will speak of that memory and you will feel the memory waken and you'll feel closer to the person. I did not have memory. Yeah. So writing poetry was a way of the closest I could get to speaking to a time that I'm sure I was there. The question about all of this that happened to me, without memory, without somebody to talk to it about, is did it happen at all? Mm. Am I some crazy guy who's been talking about his past just to kind of get some attention? You know, it's, it's the way of madness. When you come from Dubai and you come to England and you sometimes see, oh, no, no, I'll talk about Ethiopia. Like when Ethiopians come to England and I, or I go to Ethiopia, I say, I want to go for a walk on my own. Ethiopians are like, and they which is like, what? <laughs> really, you want to walk on your own? Who walks on their own? Why do you want to, why does he want to walk on his own? <laughs> you know, most good communities don't understand this. They don't do anything on their own, yeah. Well, but the thing is, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can't get married <laughs> on your own. You can't, you can't be with your partner on your own, you know. It's like, but it's like, it's like, it's about memory and contact and context. And that's what I've been fighting for. And that is why I wrote this book. Because that is how we define ourselves. We're defined by our very memories. I would love so much, Lem, for you to read from your book for us, please. Okay. Yes. Well, okay. You have a bit for me to read. I don't really want to read that bit, but I... I you can read whatever you like. Can I really? Yeah. Just, we don't have too much time, it's just something short. Yeah. Yes. Okay, all right. All right, okay. Okay, I'll read uh, chapter three, 
which is it, which is a short chapter about my school. Um, no, in fact, I'll read the preface. Okay. Yeah, it takes about a minute or so, two minutes or so. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Did you see what I did then? I went, is that okay? <laughs> was, what, what is that? I'm in my own front room going... <laughs> okay. Preface. This is right at the beginning of the book. I should do that, shouldn't I? <laughs> at 14, I tattooed the initials of what I thought was my name into my hand. The tattoo is still there, but it wasn't my name. It's a reminder that I've been somewhere I should never have been. I was not who I thought I was. The authority knew it, but I didn't. The authority had been writing reports about me from the day I was born. My first footsteps were recorded by the click clack clack of a typewriter. The boy is walking. My first footsteps were recorded. Click clack clack. The boy has learned to walk, talk. Fingers were poised above a typewriter waiting for whatever happened next. The boy is adapting. Papers zipped from typewriters and into files and the files slipped into folders under the S section of a tall metal filing cabinet. For 18 years, this process repeated over and over again, click, clack, clack. Secret meetings were held. The folders were taken out and placed on tables surrounded by men and women from the authority. Decisions were made. Put him here, put him there. Shall we try drugs, try this? Try that. After 18 years of experimentation, they threw me out. The authority locked the doors securely behind me and hid the files in a data company called the Iron Mountain. So I wrote to the authority and hand delivered the letter. The reply informed me that I had to write to customer services. I was a customer now. So I wrote to customer services. Customer services replied to say they were not permitted to release the files. The authority placed me with incapable foster parents. It imprisoned me. It moved me from institution to institution. And yet now, at 18 years old, I have no history, no witnesses, no family. In 2015, following a 30-year campaign to get my records, the chief executive of Wigan Council... Donna Hall wrote me a letter. She had them. Within a few months, I received four thick folders of documents marked A, B, C, and D. Click, clack, clack. On reading them, I knew. I took the authority to court. For How does a government steal a child and then imprison him? How does it keep it a secret? This story is how. It is an unbelievable, unbelievable. Thank you so much for reading that. And it just is oh, chilling. Pleasure. It is chilling to hear it. And it's, it's chilling to imagine. I want to know your truth. When you found your truth, how did that happen? How did you feel? And how did you start to heal from this <laughs> unbelievable process, unbelievable experience? Well, at about 16 years of age, I was two years from being thrown out, as I've just shown you on, in the preface. And my social worker, who was a good man, my later social worker, a new man, um, he gave me my birth certificate. And my birth certificate had a different name on it. It had the name Lem Sisse, and it had my mother's name, Yemarshet Sisse. And my social worker was so angry with what happened to me over the years. He said, somebody did love you. And he gave me a letter from my mother, dated 1967, pleading for me back from the social worker whom she'd given me to, to have me fostered for a short period of time. She said, how can I get Lem back? I want him to be with his own country, his own people. I don't want him to face discrimination. 
Now, for a 21-year-old Ethiopian, by the way, Ethiopians loved England. England was just the best. For a 21-year-old Ethiopian to say, I don't want him to face discrimination, must mean that she'd faced it when she was in England. She was writing to a social worker whose name was Norman. The social worker who gave me to my foster parents 18 years, 16 years earlier and said, you must call him Norman, had named me illegally after himself. Isn't that incredible? incredible. And all of these stories. So when I received my birth certificate and I received a letter from my mother, I just knew that it was proof that somebody had done something wrong. I was like, this explains it. This explains it. This is the truth, the, 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 the lie, the truth, the deception is here in the documents. Here's my mother pleading for me back to a social worker called Norman, who's, who wrote back to her by calling me Lem, which means that he'd lied to her, my mother about the fact he'd changed my name. You see, so when you find the lie, yeah. when you, this is why your parents will say to you, you know, now, are you lying? <laughs> this is why they will, they will say to you, don't lie, mm. because it hides what you may think at the time is a good thing. I, I don't want to get into truth and lie and what, but what actually um, is a kind of poison. You know, yeah. I would rather defer, defer from speaking than lie. Mm -hmm. And this is where wisdom starts to come into your grandparents, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, who may stay quiet <laughs> <laughs> at times. Absolutely. I just want to let the audience know we're about yeah. to take um, questions are they, are they okay? Audience, are you okay? Yes. Please let Lem know Good. that you are having a great time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. If you have a question, what we can, what we'd like to ask everybody to do is to actually get, there's two mics here. If you can just stand at the microphone and without removing your mask, we're going to ask you to um, give your question to Lem. But just before we do jump into the questions, I've got a couple more questions for you. If we can kind of get through them slightly quickly, if possible. You, do, you don't have to get through all the questions. We're doing, oh, I'm doing this conversation. Amazing, amazing. Because your poetry is just, it's incredible. It is really mesmerizing and millions of people around the world agree that it is just stunning. But you really are, I just feel like, um, and probably because of your experience, you're a master of understanding things at their essence. I don't know how you do it, but you take the most complex things from the alchemy of nature to the, to the intricacies of the human heart, and then you somehow distill it in the most powerful, elegant, simple way in your poetry. How do you write? How do you do that? I think that I felt as a young person when I started writing, I felt like I did not have a choice. That's the important thing. And I, I do think it's also worth remembering that, you know, what John Burnside, the poet said, which is metaphor is as close as a human being can be to their environment. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful statement. Metaphor is as close as a human being can be to their environment. And if we take our um, religious texts, for example, whether it is the Quran or the Bible or whichever text, you will see that the physical environment, the rivers, the mountains, the, uh, the storms, you know, the plagues, you know, all of the stories, the wonderful journeys from one part of the world to another that are in those religious texts, they are metaphor. For the human spirit so they may be truth you know depending on your belief you may believe it actually happened and that's true as that can be true as well but actually they are metaphors for the human spirit yeah. and so so using imagery to describe how i feel is a way of getting to the heart of the problem isn't that interesting we've just said to the heart of the problem 
to the heart of the matter. Metaphor, you know. So beautiful. So beautiful. We have a question over, over here. Just if you have a question, please do assemble at the microphone. Yes, please. Uh, Will the camera show the audience? I want to see the audience. Can we see the... Is there any way to <laughs> no, see the okay. audience? No, okay. It's okay. It's okay, okay. please go worry. ahead. Yeah, hi, Lam. It was wonderful to hear you. And uh, in your face, in the twinkle in your eye, we can see that little boy that comes again and again in the reports. You know, a happy boy, like yes. by everyone, by the staff, by everyone. So we can see that boy still in you. So my question is... Uh, uh, I mean, after hearing the book, like every, uh, you know, uh, loyal net citizen, you go look for you, who's Lem Sisse, and uh, you read your blogs and everything. You mentioned that you get a chance to meet your mother. But yes. Mother. Yeah, so, so wonderful. So did you get a chance to ask your birth mom that why she named you Lem, which, as you mentioned, means why? So why it's did you very... was it, yeah? It's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, I'll just answer very simply. I can't tell you the answer. Did you not get a chance to ask her? Because you met her a couple I of times. I did, I did, yeah. I did. Oh. But can I tell you this? Yeah. If you have my book. Yeah, I have. Right? I've read it. Right. The answer comes from my mother in the letter that she wrote. Oh, we're going to have to go back oh, over it yeah. again and, now. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll tell you this, okay? I am right now, as we speak, writing the second book to My Name Is Why. Oh, I'm really and, good, yeah. We were going to ask you, no, yeah. And we're nobody, nobody knows that the answer is in her letter. We'll have to read that again as we We're said. all going to go back so and much. read over it again yeah. now. Thank you so I, I much. Hope, I hope... I hope you get get it. I don't think you will, but it's very obvious once you know about how she was, how I was conceived. Oh, thank you. So, so I'm much. sorry. Yeah, oh. it's a wonderful question. Oh, thank we you so much. We have a second question over here. Please come through. Yep. Yes. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question about the process of writing the book. Yes. So it is said that writing is um, therapy. But at the same time, when you write about trauma, it's very painful because you relieve all those um, moments. So my question is, how was it for you? And what advice do you have for someone who um, wants to write about their past or about something they've gone through um, that it's difficult to deal with? Thank yeah. you so much. This is a very good question to talking about is writing therapy first and foremost. Writing, in my opinion, is not therapy. Um, therapy is therapy. You see? And it's very important if one, if you need therapy, if I need therapy, I go to get therapy. You, you can't be, give therapy to yourself. And th therapy comes in all different forms. You know, it could be through your faith. You know, it could be through a friend, you know, whatever it is. But I, th I think of therapy as a, a, a profession. So there are professional therapists, etc. No, I think writing can help you move on so that you can see what happened to you outside of yourself which is essentially what you do when you speak with a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, but when you speak with a therapist, you speak with an aim to be able to get through what it is you're experiencing. When you speak to your writing, your aim is that the writing is beautiful. So therapy, uh, writing can be therapeutic, but to be a writer, I said therapeutic, not therapy. Mm. But to be a writer, you want to make what it is that you've written beautiful. Mm. If your need for therapy gets in the way of you writing something beautiful, then the writing has served you because you've got something out that you needed to get out. But the writer serves the writing. And they're two very different things. Well, I'm not the yeah. boss of my own story. 
one more question over here. Yes, go ahead. From Dubai. Oh, can I just say one more thing about that last thing? Yes, and please, it's this. Go ahead. We all have moments in our lives that we believe only happen to us. And I believe that's true. We are unique as human beings. Each one of you is unique. It's really good to write about the unique moment that needs to be looked at. So I agree, writing about, about trauma is important. Mm. Sorry, yeah. yeah of course. Uh, good evening, I am Chidambaram. And my question is somewhat hypothetical in the sense that let us presume that Shugi Ben would not have been in contention for the Booker Prize. Which other book among the shortlisted would have made it to the Booker Prize? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very good. It's a very good question. Uh, first of the, all, how was it, first of all, the, judging the Booker Prize last year? Well, if I'm going to be self-centered in my answer, I would say... Number one, it was intimidating. And number two, um, it helped me through the first lockdown. Yeah. Because I just had to read books. Oh. Um, but actually, when you're a judge of a prize, of which I am, have been a judge of many prizes, um, it is your opportunity to give something back to the industry of writing. It's your opportunity to give something back, to pay service to the writers that have worked so hard to put their books out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid my answer to the question is no. And that's why there was a competition. We unanimously agreed on Shuggy Bain. However, <laughs> I mm. love the Ethiopian writer Maaza Mengista. And I think it's the first time that an Ethiopian writer has been in the shortlist of the Booker Prize in its 50-year history, 52-year wow. history. That's so incredible. for me, it's Marza Mengista, but the best person won. The best person won. There you go. So, yes, it's always going. There's got to be a winner there. Um, yeah. Just want to ask you a couple of things about change in particular um, you know, you've said about the care system and about those who were in care, we should not call care leavers great survivors. They're not morsels for our insatiable pity. They are stars like our own children, like your own children. Has the yeah. care system changed enough? What else needs to change? And also, similarly, because we, we've got to wrap up, yeah. there's been a lot around Black Lives Matter last year. Yeah. And was there change? Is there enough change there? Well, I think the more we are aware of the kind of the, the, some of the things that happen to uh, people because of the color of the skin. And that is exactly, you know, there's a lot of that in here in terms of what happened to me. Um, I think the better our society is, you know, the more we are aware of the uh, peoples uh, in our society, the better our society can be. There's been a lot of racism that's gone unchecked in England and uh, around the world. And, um, you know, it's good that we're checking, uh, we're making people accountable. To be honest, I think it's all got to do with the internet. You know, boundaries are starting to uh, become less uh, definite. Uh, information is passing quicker. Um, and the generation that were born as digital natives are starting to stand up and say, I'm not, I'm not standing for this. Um, that's not me. You know, that's a whole generation who are changing this world. You know, the binaries of black and white are not the same as they were before. The Black Lives Matter march had as many white people, probably more white people, we're marching for Black Lives Matter. So it's no longer a them and us thing. And this is how the world is changing in the generations that are born into the digital age. It's incredible. I'm so excited about our futures. And finally, I'm going to ask you this, because, you know, the theme of the festival is change the story. And I feel like to change the story, we have to have the ability to, first of all, see the truth and to have the courage to tell the truth as you do. So I want to hear from you, Lem, finally, yeah. what that means to you to change the story and how can each of us do it? 
there's a there's a great line. Uh, God, I think it's grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Isn't that beautiful? Like I've heard that a few times. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, mm. and the wisdom. What was the difference? The wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, 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 we need courage. I think there's a lot of courage out there, and I think there's a lot of love out there, and I think that, you know, if we make change with courage and love, um, it's all for the better. This book is dedicated to my foster parents and my brothers and sisters, and then it's dedicated to my mother's family and my brothers and sisters with her and my father's family, and they are all over the world, a very international family, went to international schools. My, my sisters and brothers went to colleges with with princes and um, diplomats. And um, I, I, have, I have been able to bring my story back to the various families. And I'm pleased about that. Lem, finally, we would love so much for you to leave us with, I think, one of your most beautiful poems, especially as we talk about love and we talk about courage. This poem uh, that I'm going to read for you now, it's called Invisible Kisses. And I know that I've read it before at the Dubai Literature Festival, at the Emirates Literature Festival. And I know that, I know that you have, I know that it's, it's Valentine's Day tomorrow. Um, and although this is a love poem that gets read to people, um, regarding love, it's actually about, you could say it was about what I wanted from the, from family really. But anyway, I shouldn't speak about it, I'll just read it. It's called Invisible Kisses and it's online as well. You can download it for free. It's in the book too. And it's in the book, yeah. If there was ever one whom when you were, sorry, <laughs> I've got to do this. Um, and you can send this to the person you love. Invisible kisses. If there was ever one whom, when you were sleeping, who would wipe your tears when in dreams you were weeping, who would offer you time when others demand, and whose love lay more infinite than grains of sand, if there was ever one to whom you could cry, who would gather each tear and blow it dry, who would offer help on the mountains of time and who would stop to let each sunset soothe your shaded mind. If there was ever one to whom when you run, who will push back the clouds so that you're bathed in sun, who would open arms if you would fall, who would show you everything if you lost it all. If there was ever one who, when you achieve, was there before the dream and even then believed, who would clear the air when it's full of loss, count love before cost. If there was ever one whom when you are cold will summon warm air for your heart to hold, who would make peace in pouring pain and make laughter fall in falling rain. If there was ever one who can offer you this and more, who in keyless rooms can see open doors, who in open doors can see open fields and in open fields see harvests, yield 
then see only my face in the reflection of these tides through the clear water. Beyond the river's side, all I can send is love and all that this is, a poem and a necklace of invisible kisses Thank you. As Maureen Freely says, from your sorrows, Lem, you forge beautiful words and a thousand reasons to live and to love. Lem Sisse, what an absolute incredible pleasure it is to have you back at the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature. Please join me in thanking Lem. Thank you. Thank you. And could I ask one question? Yes, please. I, I'm sorry to talk across, but I'd just like... Will you take a, a, a photograph of this moment, like of the screen, and you on the screen, and not, not you take the photograph, will the audience <laughs> just please take a photograph, right, Everybody. and please tweet it, okay? Yes, yes okay? please. This is, good. This, is good. this is me being serious. <laughs> this is me doing a Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> and this is me performing. <laughs> Okay, oh. and please tweet me at Lemsisse and hashtag Emirates Lit Fest. Please, because I, everybody. Because I want a copy of this unique event. Yes. I want a copy. If, I, if I'm not going to see your faces, I want to see your love on Twitter. Can we just wait? I've got an idea as well. We're going to do a selfie with you wow. and, and the audience. Next Hold on, I'm going to do one. Level. Wait, let's do this. So. Oh, you, are you doing it this way? Oh, I see. You've got the audience there. Is that okay? Can I sort of somehow get You can't see here? them because of the lights. That's the best that I can do. That's great. But at least that's a different angle. To, that's great. To what you that's see. Good. I want as many audience photographs do it. as possible. Take We're photographs when you leave. Tweet them because I want to see me on this screen and you in the audience as well. We're going to get you in. Don't you worry. I'll try and get my head in there somewhere as well. A bit difficult, but yeah, that's just incredible. Thank you, Lem, so, so much. My name is Y and all of Lem's books are available in the yard at Magrudy's. Thank you, Lem, so much. A big thank you. Thank you to the AV team, the audio visual team, of course, our sponsor, Emirates Airline, Dubai Culture. Thank you, Emirates Airline. Yes. I, to, I want to say thank you, Emirates Airline, because I loved the journey. The flight was great. The staff, <laughs> the staff, the students are incredible. Amazing, amazing. I love it. And of course, our founding partner, Dubai Culture, our venue partner, at Sakal Avenue, or of course, and of course, the festival parent, organization which is of course emirates literature foundation of course thank you to you for being such a phenomenal audience thank you so much everybody thank you my name is sally musa there's a lot more to come as well at the emirates airline festival of literature thank you